this book. And uh, as you're turning to Acts chapter number 9, uh, it reminds you of two uh, resources we have out there. Of course, the yard signs. There may be just a few of those left if you've not already bought one. This door knocker coordinates with that. And uh, we'll keep using this throughout the winter. But also we have these pocket size invitation cards for next week. I want you to grab these up. Let's go ahead and get all of them out of here next few days. And let's be using these as we go through the line, uh, maybe at the drive through or maybe where you eat out or maybe you pass these out at work or places uh, that you visit. And uh, let's be inviting folks to this uh, Lord's Day coming. Again, we'll do all we can to social distance and make room for everybody and hope that you'll be a part of all of that. Let's stand together, please, as we read God's Word in Acts chapter 9. Pick up reading in verse number 1 of Acts chapter 9, and we're in a series right now entitled Acts, God's Book on Revival. This is the history book of revival, the history book of the beginning of the church, and lots of information here. I will not, of course, get to everything, but hitting the high spots as we work our way through verse number 1. <clears throat> and Saul, this is the man that was going to become the Apostle Paul, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters uh, to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that is, of being a Christian, of a believer, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Let me just stop and say, not every King James Bible has that red lettered. Some are Oxford versions of the King James. Some are different type of, I shouldn't say versions, but the way they're printed, I should say, and put together. How many of you, that phrase, Saul, Saul, is red lettered? Would you hold your hand up, okay? Uh, if it's not red lettered in your Bible, you don't have a funny Bible. It's just that you may not have a, a you either have one or the other. I don't even know what I have. I've got the NIV here tonight, but uh, <clears throat> I'm kidding. I, ha I have a, a King James Bible, which is an open Bible, but uh, that's red letter. Now that lets us know that Jesus is speaking in the in the New Testament. We find red letters everywhere where Jesus speaks because Jesus was alive. Hey, he's alive right here. He's out of the grave and he's alive. Verse number five, and he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That word means ox goads or the prodding stick that is used to move along uh, a, uh, an animal. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it should be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him, uh, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but, l but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat or drink. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise. Notice the difference in how Paul respond Saul responded to the Lord in that vision, and how Ananias responded. Ananias, a believer already, Saul becoming a believer, uh, he responded completely differently. He was very, very obedient. I hear my Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for not the Judas Iscariot, but for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And all this information was given to Saul there on the road to Damascus, the names, the place, all of that. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, I like this, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way hast thou, as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightst receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight from forthwith. 
They rose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And draw your attention to verse number six. I'd like to read verse six with me out loud together. In unison, verse six, ready? And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I'll speak on this subject for just a while tonight, the conversion of Saul. I don't have a flashy title. That's pretty much what's going on here. Uh, this man, who would be one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament, was saved on this day. Let's pray together. Father, bless your word and challenge us, Lord, with truth tonight, we pray. Give me your help as I preach. Stir us up, Lord. Oh, how we need revival. Dear God, as we just watch the news or listen to the news, read about it today and yesterday, we saw all the fear that's in our nation. We saw the potential of just a downturn uh, in our nation in many, many ways. The possibilities of what could be that are so negative at times. But then we put our faith and trust in Thee and we remember that You're in complete control. Lord, what we need more than anything is to see our church revived, churches like ours revived. Dear God, please move on us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Just the idea and the possibility of being converted is a wonderful, wonderful truth. How many of you are glad you're saved tonight? How many of you are glad you're not the person you could have been? Amen. We've already studied some about the background of Saul, and, and we learned earlier how he had authorized the stoning of Stephen. But I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians. Let me just kind of read his pedigree if I could. He gives it in, in the book of Philippians. We have Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Turn there and verse chapter number 3. And let me just read just a couple verses here in Galatians, or excuse me, in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to pick up reading in verse number 4. Here he just takes a moment and says a little bit about his background, his history. We find out several things here as he gives this testimony to the people at Philippi. Verse number four of Philippians chapter three, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I more. And what he's saying is this, I'm about to tell you how good a person I thought I was before I got saved. And uh, God knocked all of this out of him on the road to Damascus. But I'm going to tell you what he thought of himself on that day as he was yet breathing out threatenings there. Here's what he said. Circumcised the eighth day. That means a lot to a Jew. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe, all blameless. Then he said this, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He, in other places, he talks about just his background and how he was really the man of the hour in the Pharisee makeup of the day. Turn back there to chapter 9 of Acts. Here in Acts, we find this man who thought so highly of himself, he is doubling down now on his hatred of Christians. God always has a way of getting his man. There's a little word here in your King James Bible is very important. That word is the word yet in verse number 1. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. What does that mean? He yet, that means God was so working on him. You'll see in just a moment, God was working on him now as he was many days earlier, as I mentioned in a previous message. And all that God was showing him and all that God, how he was prodding him along, yet breathing out threatenings. And what I'm saying is sometimes people double down on what they're trying to accomplish just to get their mind off of how Christ is working. Listen now, don't ever do that. I've said it before, I'll say it again, don't ever fight against God, don't ever fight without God, don't ever forget that. And so here's a man that felt like he was vindicated in what he was doing. I, I pretty much have three points tonight, I want you to write these down if you would, but let me just say that God always knows how to get, how to get his man and it could be that God's coming after you tonight uh, with the laser pointer of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let that pass you by. Number one, write this down. Uh, Saul was a man on a mission against Christ. He was a man on a mission against Christ. The Bible says that he desired him letters to Damascus from the high priest so that he would go into all the synagogue, which by this time 
was where the Christians were starting to gather. They were being saved in such a fast rate that they were taking over some of the Jewish synagogues. This bothered, the, uh, the, uh, the, this bothered Saul in a great way. And he said, uh, these letters, I want them to read. If I find anybody that's a, a born-again Christian, whether it's a man or a woman, I want to arrest them. I want to cuff them. I want to take them down to Jerusalem so they'll be put on trial and killed. That's what I want. And so uh, his path in life, though a very, very zealous one, was in complete opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was going in the wrong direction in life. Very sincere, but sincerely wrong. May I say that he was killing Christians. And had he remained on this path in life, he would have died and gone to hell. How many know someone that's on the wrong path? God needs to turn them around. There's a lot of people in America right now that's on, on the wrong path. There are people living in your neighborhood. There are people that you work with. There's people you go to school with that's on the wrong path. And they need the Lord Jesus Christ. And Saul was one of those people. There have been many famous people who have been very sincere and intentional in their mission in life. But they were on the wrong mission. Sincerely wrong. And I want to ask you right now. I know that many in here, if not most in here, you're a born-again Christian. But I want to ask you right now, are you on the right path? Are you on the right mission? Is your mission for Christ or is your mission against Christ? Have you ever, ever, ever even thought about your mission? Mark Twain, though not a, 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 a great godly man, was, was a wise man. He said this at one time. He said the two greatest days in a man's life are the day that he is born and the day that he learns why he was born. It was a great day that I don't remember. It was a great day that I was born, and I know my mom and dad rejoiced in all of that, and now that I'm alive, I'm glad that I was born. But it was a great day when Mike Norris finally figured out, shortly after he was married in 1978, why God made me. And I'm not suggesting everybody in here is called to preach. I am suggesting God has a plan for everybody under the sound of my voice. Young people, don't ever forget that. God has something special for you. Now, with that said, God had a plan for Paul's life, and that God, we're seeing it worked out right here. He was a man on a mission, but he was a man on a mission against Christ. He was very sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. Number two, write this down. He was a man under conviction by Christ. He was a man under conviction by Christ. Look at verses 3 through 6. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This idea of conviction is becoming foreign today in our culture. But it wasn't years ago. People are developing thick skin and a callousness in our nation like never before. But in Paul's day, especially in the books, book of Acts, People very sensitive and tender-hearted to the things of God. The Bible says here that there was a light from heaven that shined down on him. He saw the light, you might say. He saw the truth. You know what? The, as I mentioned this morning, how truth has fallen in the street. And I'll just tell you this right now. There is truth all around us today, but people are so willingly blinded to the truth. Don't ever be like that. The Holy Spirit of God had been working on him for quite some time. The idea of the ox goads or the prodding him over and over again was in a spiritual process of, of, of God just kind of moving him in the right direction. That's what you use with an ox goad. You take those young people, you don't know what that is. Now we have these, the, I don't know what they have now, but when I used to move cattle around, we had a big old long thing that had, it was loaded full of batteries, had two probes on the end of it, and a little button that you push, and you got that up against that cow. It's kind of like you tase him. Don't tase me, man. And you tased that, that cow. And you got that cow to move pretty much where you wanted him to go. 
That ox go was a very long stick, and he would he was, it was sharp on the end. He would prod that ox along to get that ox where it wanted to go. That's exactly what the Spirit of God does in your life. If you're paying attention, he will prod you. He will move you to get you exactly where he wants you to be. He was yet breathing out threatenings because God kept moving him, kept moving him, kept working on the heart of this man, Saul, who would someday come the Apostle Paul. And he finally realizes that he's fighting against God and not fighting for God. And this was a great awakening to Paul because he thought the opposite. He thought with all of his heart that he was fighting for God. Do you know there are people that are very, very sincere, and I don't mean to pick on anybody tonight, but, but I think that many in the, in the Catholic hierarchy really are convinced that they're working for God. I think they're very, very sincere to isolate themselves from the rest of society, and some are celibate, and they take the oath of never marrying. I think they're very, very sincere, but you can tell they're unregenerate because many of them, not all of them, but many of them get off track uh, in, in their lives, uh, in, in purity speaking in other ways, and they end up doing things. I remember years, years ago, I was in California meeting, and Brother Alan Fong took me to this place on the coastline where, uh, where we went out to ease, big glassed-in place. We were looking out over the, the bay there. And uh, I remember as I sat there, and I've told you this story before, there were a bunch of uh, these uh, priests they had on their big, long, long robes, and they were walking around. There's probably about 25 or 30 of them. They were walking around. Uh, this particular path coming up from some particular religious uh, s- site there on, on the coastline. And I asked Brother Fong, I said, Brother Fong, what in the world? I mean, it's kind of eerie, you know. I don't know if they were chanting as they were going or whatever. He said, there's a very large Jes- Jesuit priest, uh, whatever you call those places, they all get in and uh, Coventry or whatever, there. And it's a place where they taught them and trained them. And these were the young monks or whatever they called them. I'm probably getting all that wrong. But they were coming around through there. And I said, that is just so sad. As we were walking out, now where we were eating, there was not a bar. But upstairs in this building, there was a bar. And as we were eating, we had to take the elevator. I'm sad to say this and forgive me. I should have never done it. But the preacher was taking me in there. I was his guest. But we rode the elevator. We had to ride the elevator to go down where we were at to get in the glass, out, the glass place where we were eating. But you had to ride the elevator up and go through the lobby and go past where that bar was. As we were going through that lobby, all those priests were walking in that bar and lining up at that bar to drink. I looked at him and I said, what in the world? He said, well, they think nothing of that. Let me just say something. There's a lot of people that are very sincere in what they believe. What would cause a young Muslim boy to strap a bomb on himself and go into a crowd and blow up innocent people. I'm going to tell you why. They're sincere about what they believe, but they are sincerely wrong. The apostle Paul was killing people for God, he thought. And on this day, he realized that he was not fighting for God. He was fighting against God. And it was a great awakening for the apostle Paul. The Bible says here that he found out on that day that he was literally persecuting Jesus himself every time he killed or persecuted a Christian. Now, wait a minute. We should be careful right here. Every time you fight against the gospel, every time you fight against the message of the preacher, every time you fight against the progress of the church, You're not fighting against flesh and blood. You're fighting against the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes the gospel and the progress of the church and the gospel message very seriously. Verse 6 states in this matter of a man under conviction by Christ, verse 6 states that that this... uh, conviction of God affected him physically and emotionally. Look at the verse. The Bible says in verse 6 that he was trembling and astonished. Let me define those words. That means that this man that had it all together, yet breathing out threatening, said, blank, 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 I can't wait till I get my hands on it. I can't wait till I bow. I'm so sick of the Christians. They're going to cause me all kind of trouble. They're going to cause me. Anyway, he, was, he was very, very confident. All of a sudden, this light comes down. He falls under heavy conviction. And it begins to tremble. The word astonish means setting struck dumb in silence. This 
man that was previously breathing out threatenings now sat silent before God, obviously under heavy conviction. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you was under heavy conviction? I'm talking to Christians now. I understand what conviction is for a person that's never been born again. But how do you expect an unsaved person to fall under conviction about their sin when Christians are no longer convicted about their sin? I understand the altar sometimes dry up because of social distancing or whatever you've been fed, and I understand that. I understand a person can make their decisions in their seat. I understand. I, I know that. But somewhere along the line, there ought to be some Christians, some American Christians that are so sensitive to the Spirit of God and their sin that they feel under, fall under heavy conviction to fix it. Repentance is not just a word for somebody that's unsaved. Repentance is for the believer just as much and maybe more so. This is a huge problem today and an indicator of just how bad America needs revival. Now, I want you to know something. I'm the pastor of this church, and I think we've got one of the best churches in America. But we're not a perfect church. And we're a church that's loaded with human beings that are sinners saved by the grace of God, and you and I need to learn to keep our sin on short account. I'm not talking about other people's sin I'm talking about my sin, your sin, all God's people's sin. We need to make sure that we're keeping that on short accounts. And that's not going to happen if we're never convicted. When's the last time as you were praying that you named your sin? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do you want me to mention? Smoking pot? Or how about maybe gossiping? What do you want me to mention? Getting drunk in the gutter? Or how about lying? What do you want me to mention? Gambling? Or maybe unfaithfulness? He was a man under heavy conviction. Trembling. I've watched that happen. You don't see it often. Then number three, write this down. He was a man who made a decision for Christ. It's not as vague as it seems if you read all 19 verses, which is why I did that. It, was, it seemed like a process. But this man, you understand that the moment a person is saved is the moment they say in their heart, I believe. And he was doing that throughout these three verses here, verses 4 through 6, talking with the Lord, believing the Lord. He was a man that made a decision for Christ. This man was a man of high standing. He had a very sharp mind. He was a man who was very popular. He was a man of wealth. He was a man who had a bright future serving in the world. This, this man was a sincerely, uh, who sincerely thought he was right, but this was a man who had enough sense to ask two of the most important questions that you can ever ask. And I want you to note these tonight, and I'm finished. Number one, he asked this question, who art thou, Lord? The Bible says this in verse number five. He said, he fell to the earth in verse number four, and he said, who art thou, Lord? In other words, I, I want to I validate who it is that's talking to me. And Jesus said, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. Can you imagine the conviction that shot through his soul? Who art, thou, who art thou, Lord? He's Jesus, the Son of God. And I guess here's the convicting part where we get the death and the burial and the resurrection. He was not just Jesus, the Son of God. He was Jesus, the living God, the one who, whom Paul's friends had crucified and nailed an old rugged cross just days earlier and sent him to a grave is now alive and well, and talking to the apostle in an audible voice on the road to Damascus. Wait a minute. This is the man that I don't like. I hate. I, I believe he was, he was a blasphemous man. 
and this is a man that we thought we killed, and this is a man that they said he got out of the grave, but that was all a lie. That's what he thought. And now this is the man, the Son of God, the resurrected Savior that's speaking to me right now. By the way, that's where power is right now in that resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what lifts you out of the miry clay and sets your feet on a solid rock. It's not so much that Jesus died and shed his blood and was buried three days and thank God for the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all of our sins. But had he stayed in the grave, you and I would not be born again right now. But Jesus Christ got out of the grave and that was the power that Paul was smitten with on that day on the road to Damascus. This man is alive. He is alive. He is alive. And now I've got to do something about that. By the way, he's alive in your soul tonight. If you trust him as your savior, that's what conversion is all about. That's what being born again is all about. They call that regeneration. You're born to a new life. And thank God for that. Is a man who had to make a decision. And he said this, he said, who, who art thou Lord? Knowing who Jesus is and believing him by faith is the only way that a person can be saved. The only way. That is why it's such an important question. Now, I want to stop and say this right here because the word Lord is used, and I'm not trying to inject any type of lordship salvation right here because you're saved by believing in Jesus Christ. But it's very obvious who he made Lord of his life right there because his life changed. I am so glad that salvation is by believing. He's Lord whether you make him Lord or not. But how long is it going to take you in your life to let him have complete control of everything? The second question is found right here. What wilt thou have me to do? This is a question that's going to require Paul to make a complete change in lifestyle. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, and I quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. How many of y'all believe that? Okay, listen to me. Why is it not working? Why is it not happening? Why is it that it appears in this age as we get closer to Christ's return where people should be walking close to him. Why does it seem to me, and why does it seem to many of you that people are not as close to Christ that some are walking away? Some are making up their own rules. Well, the answer to that is the age of apostasy. The answer to that is false believers. There's a lot of answers to that, to that weak Christians and so forth. But when are we going to dig out of that and say, we're, not, we're going to rise above all of that? And so he says, what wilt thou have me to do? Though his conversion was immediate, the Lord phased him into this new life. I want to kind of just highlight these things. In verse 17, he makes a public profession to Ananias, and he calls him Brother Saul. He is baptized in verse 18, which had nothing to do with his salvation, but is one of the things that, as he's discipled, he was taught to do. In verse 19, the Bible says, uh, then uh, was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And here they caught him up, brought him up to speed as a disciple. You may say that they discipled him and taught him the things, uh, the basic things of, uh, of, of Christ and of the church and so forth. There were other times that he attached himself with, uh, oh, who were the tent makers? Somebody tell me, who were they? No, they got killed. Who were that? So I was getting ready to say, but who? Yeah, that there old Aquiller and Priscilla, those two people right there. And he attached them, and they, they taught him as well. And so, I mean, the apostle was always a teachable person. I mean, he wanted to know more and more. And so uh, he's discipled, and this we're seeing now his, how his life takes off as he makes this decision for Christ. He obviously learns of his mission, which was shared by God uh, to Ananias in verse 15. I want to read that in just a moment. But God, I think that Jesus Christ that day when he made his decision, there's a lot more that Jesus poured into his heart on that road to Damascus than what you and I read in the scriptures. And so, but we find out a little more what was poured into him. Look at verse number uh, 11. It says, the Lord said unto him, that is Ananias, arise and go into the street, which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Now, let me explain to you what that means. That means that over the road to Damascus, he told him, he said, he said, uh, uh, verse number six, he said, arise and go into the city. It should be told thee what thou must do. 
And so I think there was more information given there. He knew what street to go to, what address. He knew what house to go to and the man that owned that house. And he knew what to do once he got there. He got there and he began to pray. Now watch this in in, uh, verse 12. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. And so this information is coming to Saul. There's going to be a man named Ananias come and talk to you. He's going to put his hand on you and you're going to receive your sight. He was stricken blind there. They had to lead him to this place. And so Ananias uh, pops back. He said, Lord, he said, I've heard many uh, by many of this man, how much evil he had done to the saint, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that, that call on thy name. And he already knew, and I already knew this man was coming to town to arrest people. But the Lord said, and here, here is the plan. He says, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. So we find out some things about the apostle. We find out he's going to be a chosen vessel to God. We find out he's going to bear his name before the Gentiles. That was foreign at this point. He was going to be the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And kings uh, and, and the children of Israel. In other words, he's going to stand before kings. And I think he stood before Felix, Festus, Agrippa. And some believe he stood before Caesar himself. This would be the man that would stand before kings and give testimony. The Bible says here, he stand before kings. He stand before the children of Israel. And the apostle never gave up on the children of Israel. He said, I've turned to the, to the Gentiles. But he always had a love for the, for the Israelites. And he said, I'm going to show him great things that he's going to do. Paul's going to do great and tremendous, many of them great things he's going to do for the Lord, but he's going to suffer through all of it. So here the apostle setting, he's praying. He's waiting for Ananias to come. And he knows that God has something special for him. Can I get you to understand something? Have you ever heard somebody say, well, that person's unsaved, but they ever get saved and get going the right direction, they could really do something for God. You ever hear anybody say that? Paul was one of those. And I wonder how many more people like Paul are out there that if we would just get the gospel to them and see them come to Christ, you never know what they'll do for the Lord. And he was converted. He obviously learns of his mission. He begins to preach in verse number 20. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Boy, the first time he ever did that. Look at the response. And all that heard him were amazed, and not in a good way either, and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. So he begins to preach. Immediately he begins to feel the pushback from the rest of the disciples. Then he begins to experience the people who desire to kill him, verses 23 and 24. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. The people that he ran with now is trying to kill him. And by laying await, uh, uh, but their laying await was known, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So he begins to feel and sense the persecution now that he would endure for the rest of his life until he went home to be with the Lord. What a glorious conversion. What a wonderful decision he made for the Lord. But I like verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus proving that this is very Christ. He began to feel the precious power of the Holy Spirit. Never knew what that was before. He operated completely in his flesh, his tenacity, his ability just to be a man, man. But now he's emptied of himself. He walked away from all of that. And he begins to feel the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in his life. The Bible says it strengthened him as he preached the gospel. There's a song in our hymn book entitled, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. The first verse goes something like this. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. How many say, preacher, I remember the day that Jesus came into my heart. It's a wonderful day. I was a little boy. I'll never forget it. I was under heavy conviction for several days. I slept in the same room that my little brother Timmy slept in. My other brother slept across the hallway. And mom and dad's room was just around the corner of a small house in Evans, West Virginia. I would lay awake at night for a long time, scared to death. 
I felt like that something lived in our closet. I found out after I grew up that it was actually the flu coming out of the basement that would cool and heat up and pop and crack. And I thought something, somebody's going to come out of that closet and kill me. And if it killed me, I, I, really, I really believe that. I'm not just saying that. I started to say I'm not just whistling Dixie, but you're not allowed to say that anymore. And uh, I just, I had this fear of dying. I had this fear of not being ready to go to heaven. And my preacher that I mentioned this morning, he was a very, very nice man. But I'm going to tell you what, he would get in the way with the Lord. I mean, it was very convicting as a little boy. And I remember the day that I couldn't take it much longer. We were driving home in that Chevrolet sedan. I started talking to my mom. Three of us in the back seat. We didn't wear seat belts. We didn't know what a car seat was. So I leaned up over the back seat. I remember like holding my arms up over the back seat. And I said, Mom, I want to be a Christian. What do I need to do to become a Christian? She said, well, now, Michael, you know that. She started talking to me about that. I remember where the conversation started on Highway 33 between Ripley and Evans, West Virginia. There used to be two culverts running underneath the road right there. And your car would go bump, bump as you went across those culverts, even though the road was paved. I can still take you to that place right at the end of Carney and Ford Road. We had just about five, six minutes. We'd cross the Mill Creek Bridge and drive around Rollins Lake. We drove around Rollins Lake and around Hirschman Curve and down over into the valley. In Evans, West Virginia, and up Maple Drive, about six houses on the left. We pulled into there, and I remember I could not wait to get in the house and get on my knees. And ask Jesus Christ to save me. I never forget that day. I never forget where I was at. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. The meanest boy in school, his name was Jerry. Monday morning I went to school. I had to find Jerry. I had to get him converted, had to get him born again. Me and another little boy, Ricky, was saved already. We got him cornered outside in the Evans school. We told him, we said, Jerry, you're going to die and burn in hell if you don't get right with God. I'll never forget that. I don't believe he got in that day, I'll be honest with you. Matter of fact, I think we probably got in a fight. I'm not sure. No, we didn't. But I remember that was in May, and it was just a little too cold to get baptized. We did not have a baptistry, and I remember that when it got warm enough, we went down to a Chateau Road, and I was baptized there in the creek. And I remember they cut the, they took the shovels and the hose, and they would cut the little steps in the, in the muddy bank where you'd step down into the creek. I remember all that. I remember the preacher taking his pole and prodding around to find out where the deep spot was, and I've told you this before, I'll tell you again, I remember that I thank God that the cattle were downstream that day and not upstream. <laughs> but I remember the day that I got baptized, I remember, I tell you what, I'm so, I, I've never, I, I know everybody's different, I know everybody's different, but I've never, been, I've never been worried about my salvation since that day, because I so much wanted to be a Christian. Let me ask you a question. Are you a changed person because of Christ? I want you to get this and I'm finished. A revival is very influential. And churches don't have the influence they need to have right now because we're not in a state of revival. When we can be. The Apostle Paul, I believe, was very aware of the wave of revival that was passing through Jerusalem. It was literally wearing him out. There weren't just hundreds being saved. We've already read about it. There were thousands being saved. And his numbers count in those synagogues was going down, 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 down. And it was wearing him out night and day. I've got to do something about this. We've lied about them. We've spoken bad about them. We've done everything we can to give them bad press. And it seems like they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Only thing I know to do now is kill them. And he found a way to legally do that. But when he got to the root of the cause of the revival, which was Jesus Christ and the gospel, and will always be Jesus Christ and the gospel, then he knew something had to change. And I'm going to ask you tonight, our theme still revival. I'm going to ask you tonight to begin and keep praying that God would send us revival and that God would send you revival in your heart. To be converted means 
that you're not the same person that you used to be and that you're trying to grow in the Lord. And what I'm seeing today in many Christians' lives is they're going the other way. Oh, but preacher, I, I love God just as much as I ever did. I'm sure you do. Sure you do. But it must have been pretty weak before you, when you first started loving him. Because Christians should be drawing closer to Christ right now. This man Saul got saved on that day, and it's going to change the whole book of what we're reading. Because this man gets on fire for God. What we need today is some people that's not just patriots. And thank God for every patriot that's on fire for, 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 for the cause of America right now. What we need right now is some Christians to be on fire for God. We stand together, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I want to ask you, this altar is open right now. Maybe you want to come and start praying for revival right now. What about the day when you got saved? Was there a change in your life? That's between you and the Lord. If there has been, would you not pray, begin to pray for a change in America and for a change in the people's lives around us? I'm going to tell you what will save America is get Americans saved. That wasn't coined by me. I think Lester Roloff or someone else said that, but we need it so desperately. We need it in our homes, our families. Maybe right now God's convicting you about some sin in your life that you need to get rid of right now. Maybe it's something private. You don't have to confess it to anybody. You just want to get it fixed. Get it behind you tonight. Tonight's the night to do it. We believe that Jesus Christ will wash all of our sins away. We'll confess. If you're here tonight, you're not sure that heaven's your home. We'll have somebody standing on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'll take that Bible tonight and go show you how you could be a born-again Christian. If you've been saved and not been baptized, they'll help you with that. They'll coach you through every bit of that. If you've been saved and baptized, like to join our church, we'd love to have you come. Father, tonight, help us to be tender to the Spirit of God. Give us that sweet conviction one more time. We might keep our sins on short account. And help our church to see that revival, please, we pray. And help our nation as well, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you come right now, these men will help you. Come on, would you, as we sing? And for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Lord, oh, how we need revival. We pray for it on a regular basis, Lord, but we need to prepare for it. Help us as a church to see it. Help us as a nation, Lord, please. To get turned around. Before it's too late, we ask you, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I remember, it's been years ago now, the revival we had in the tent out back, it seemed to continue. And I remember uh, a lot of things occurred after that in our church and then you know by and by it seemed like that kind of went cold but there's a certain portion of that went on for several years churches experienced that I'm just so glad that our church had the chance to do that I sure would like to see that again God has to do it but we have to want it and um, I trust that you'll keep praying about all of that I talk to preachers all the time I on Sunday mornings, my phone starts buzzing with preachers that are texting me from the East Coast because they're getting up an hour earlier than me. We get about 6 o'clock or so, and sometimes earlier. My wife, I think, gets up at 4, but 
But, um, um, and then as I get to church, the guys on the West Coast are texting me. They're starting to move toward church. And, and uh, then my phone is going off. But I talk a lot of preachers. And uh, it's slow go out there, folks. It's slow go. If they're even having church, they're having it outside or they're having it online. Um, attendance is way, way down in most churches, the people that I talk to. And it's just slow. It's, it's, in a sense, it's slow here. Our visitation program's not got off the ground yet. I talked to the bus workers. I feel kind of bad about this, but I talked to the bus workers several weeks ago, thinking then that we'd turn the curve. And boom, we shot back up. I think, what, well, we're 18% or something right now in our county. We had four more schools closed last week right here in the area. These would be kids we're picking up. So wisdom has told us just to kind of hold off. It's slow go. But I, I read something just today. Somebody said the word 2020. If nothing else, when we think of 2020, we think of 2020 vision. If nothing else, maybe God used 2020 to let us see the light, to see deception, to see the lies, to see just how bad things really are. That's how he's worked in my life. It's almost like in my life, God just kind of jerked the cover off of things that in Christianity and even in our church that I thought, wow, I sure didn't know that was there. Maybe in your own family, in your marriage and so forth, some of that's going on. You can make that a positive thing. I don't want you to become a cynic where you just are sensitive to how bad everything is because it's just the way the world is. But let's use that to turn us in the right direction for the Lord. If God lets us come out of this downturn that we're in, and I pray that he does, I want our church to come out strong and ready to go and be a mighty, mighty force for the Lord. As you're leaving tonight, don't forget to pick up some of these. I think Jordan's here. He's got an announcement. I think Mr. Wagoner has an announcement as well. And uh, thank God for these gentlemen, uh, how they helped me. Uh, Jordan was supposed to pray today and tonight and forgot all about him. I'm glad he was graceful. <laughs> just a couple announcements. Our sports program is uh, for the kids' basketball it is just around the corner. The first game is going to be January 23rd. I say just around the corner. I know it's a little over a month away. But I want to let you know that registration is now open. So you can go to FRBC Sports. <clears throat> Dot com and register today. Also, if you're interested in coaching or you coached in the past, if you just see me, I know y'all love hearing that. Uh, amen. Thank you, Brother Pearson. He's going to coach four for me this year. So, um, also, teenagers, we do have uh, this Thursday, December 10th, we are having a Christmas ice skating at the fountains. You can enjoy ice skating and ice cream. We're not going to make ice cream with the ice, I promise you that. Uh, but we'll be under the stars there. Cost for the activity is $10. The bus will leave at 6.30 uh, and be back around 8.30. So if you're interested, that's this Thursday uh, at 6.30. Be here at 6.30. Cost is $10. If you're interested in going to that, I need you to do two things. Number one, go to the information desk tonight and sign up. And then number two, go to our church's west website, franklinroadbaptist.org. There's a waiver form on there. You're not signing your life away. You just scroll down and click on the... Um, I don't even know what it's called. Sorry, Matt. Something very, very fancy that's on a website. Click on that, and then there's a form for you to fill out, a waiver form, and uh, that'll help us. So if you have any questions, please see me. Thanks. Yes, also, don't forget, those of you that want to come to the Heritage Christmas Banquet, it is Friday night. I do apologize last week. I think, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it was Saturday, and it is not Saturday. So... Those of you that had an argument about that amongst yourselves, I'll clear it up tonight, okay? Um, it's Friday night at 6 o'clock, okay? Uh, I just need you, though, to sign up, though, if you plan on coming, because as far as me getting the food and the quantities and so forth, we will take measures to make sure we keep as much of the social distancing uh, active as we can, uh, limit the number of seats at the tables and whatnot, but we want you to come, okay? This is probably our second event of the whole 2020. And so if you can come Friday night at six o'clock, just sign up for me at the, at the information desk and happy to have you.